Hi there, I'm playing with Chunk again. Uh, I have some more uh, IBM servers to take apart. Uh, this module here, it's a book module from an e-server P5. Uh, I don't remember the exact model. It's a little bit older than the Z9 that I uh, took apart in the, in the last video. Uh, I want you to show this one because it has uh, some interesting mechanical features. The um, architecture is about the same as the, the, Z5, uh, the Z9 book. We have CPUs, two uh, in this case. We have memories here. We have a lot of cards that are not installed. I assume there are also memory slots. And then we have I.O. cards here with some big connectors that probably go down to the I.O. cage and to other CPU book modules. IBM calls them books because they are standing upright in a shelf. Uh, this machine has four books, or it has space for four books per rack. If you want more, you have to buy more racks. Now, an impressive part is this uh, connector array here. You can see there are, I don't know, thousands of contacts, power contact here in the center for the smaller power supplies, massive aluminium bracket here. Then on the side we have power contacts, that's the heavy, I don't know how many amps power supply. On the Z9 there was a 1 volt 800 amp power supply, which I will present in another video. So I assume these connectors here are made for, I don't know, 1000 amps or something, something like that. Now, with this massive connector here, you need quite a lot of force to insert or remove this module from the rack. And as you can see, we have two black knobs here on the front and I will show you how that works. So you have to imagine this whole book standing upright that way. Then you pull out this handle and the other one and when you swing the, band, uh, the handle inwards it will push about here is a, a bracket uh, on, the, on, the, on the cabinet. It will push the entire module out about one inch or a couple of centimeters. You have to operate both, both uh, handles in the same time. And then you can pull it out here on these handles. And you need a crane or a second or maybe a third person to lift it because this uh, module here, uh, I just can guess the weight, it's probably 40, 50 kilos. And the biggest part of the weight, I have already unscrewed that, is this massive, I can hardly lift it with one hand. That's solid copper, about one centimeter. The cooling fins are, I guess, copper too, but they are uh, plated with tin or something else. We have two of them. The other one is also already unscrewed. 
the local guys are testing their cars today. You can hear that. We have two uh, of these uh, multi-chip modules that IBM is famous for with uh, thermal sensors here. Now I have to switch to the tripod because uh, they are very heavy and it's not possible to remove them with only one hand. Okay, I have already unscrewed the brackets on this CPU here, so I can simply lift that out now. There are also four big screws on the bottom side with springs, bigger than the one on the Z9. And we see there is the socket sandwich thing. It is also held with these plastic clips on the side. Yep, that just fly away. Okay, no problem. I don't have to assemble that again. Now there's a bit of difference between this one and the socket of the Z9. The Z9 had holes with little golden springs inside and this one looks more like the, the spring type uh, connections of the, for example, uh, Intel sockets. Maybe I can go closer on that. I don't know how many pins this is here, probably 5100 and something, like in the, in the Z9, yeah. Now have a look at the chip, let me get some tools. So here we see they used some metal shims with th different thickness. This one is about the tenth of a millimeter. This is probably a half millimeter. So they adjusted the, the height of this um, bracket here to the size of the CPU chip. which is very well attached to that heat spreader. I hope I won't break it. Well, the chip seems to be glued very well into that heat spreader. Now some little details. There was a screw in the middle here. I assume this was to fill up the the cavity with thermal paste. There is no thermal paste here, just some a layer of silicon grease. And if you look at the at the, at the threads here, they are not just uh, cut into the copper. They use the helicoil inserts to make the, the thread more robust. Copper is very soft, so. If you screw and unscrew that a couple of times, you probably wear the, the thread out. So they inserted this steel heli coils here. It's a very nice touch. Let's have a look first at the thermal sensor here. It 
it is surprisingly long. Um, it has six pairs of wires, a white pair, a brown and a red pair. And I would say there are three different sensors here, maybe one at the edge, one in the scent, uh, yeah, here halfway, and one at the tip, which goes to the center of the chip, probably. Maybe they made something more exclusive with this sensor here. Sorry for my dirty hands, but with this kind of systems you sometimes get dirty hands. I did not break the chip, but I just broke my screwdriver. It's very hard, maybe I have to leave it in, but I don't give up. Okay, I'm back with the brutal force of two big screwdrivers. It suddenly works. I don't know, they seems they used some silicon glue or something like that. Hmm. Crusty. Is that a nice chip or not? So after cleaning the thermal paste, it will certainly look very, very nice. And uh, I think now I know for what the center screw is. The center screw is not to fill this cavity with the thermal compound because they applied the thermal compound to the chips individually. No, this one is to push that uh, chip out of the frame. So with the other chip I will try to do it that way. You always should read the manual if you have one. Okay, chip is clean, workshop is dirty, hands are clean too. Um, I managed it not to break off any of these coupling or decoupling capacitors. It has a very nice appearance. Some chips are red, some chips are green. It seems it's not an optical uh, effect. They really put some green paint on the chips. I assume, I, I have not found any uh, technical information on this, but I assume we have four CPUs and four cache chips here. They also added this black uh, glue here to make the capacitors a little bit more stable on the chip, not as on the chips of the Z9 where they break off easily. So we ha also have a part number here, I hope you can read that. Yep. That's the chip. Nice one. Perhaps this one is going to eBay. You can bid on it if you want. I will put it in the comments below if I do so. I want to show you how to remove that CPU chip. That's the bottom side of the book module. These are the four screws that hold the chip uh, press the chip onto the board. There is a special tool for that. I don't have it, but it will work like that. They are quite massive, like the valve. Oh, I just see they are, there are two springs inside each other. 
they are like uh, valve springs of, a, of an engine. You can use them for your next uh, gasoline project. After removing the screws on the bottom side, I can open these screws from these brackets. Same procedure as for the other chip. Now let's have a look on the memory boards. I have already disassembled this one because, oops, yes, that was a mistake. Okay, I have to put out that one first. Because I destroyed this, because these dims here are not in a socket, although it looks like a socket, but they are soldered in. You see here, solder, then we have this bracket here, which is, which is also soldered to the board. So if you want to upgrade your memory, you have to buy an entire module. How big they are? 2 gigabytes. Okay. So we have 8 gigabytes here, which was 10 years ago. I don't know exactly when this machine came out. An enormous amount of uh, memory. Uh, 8. 16, 32 gigabytes, cost a fortune of course, especially when they are from IBM. Okay, that one won't come out, it's a different kind of, okay, it's some kind of, I don't know, maybe someone has an idea. Come on, focus, what that could be. I'm too lazy to look for it now. Okay, um, let's go to another machine.